Thanks everyone for coming. Um, we have Bernadette Murphy here today to read some of her um, creative nonfiction. Um, before we begin though, I also just want to plug a class that I'm teaching in the spring called It's Creative Nonfiction. It's a brand new class and I have flyers up here. So if you're really interested and Bernadette Murphy is reading today, you know that you will have the opportunity to have, write similar kinds of writing and do similar projects in that class this spring. Um, so I want to just introduce Bernadette before she comes on up, and then we will have a question and answer afterwards, so again, you have an opportunity to buy a book if you'd like. Bernadette Murphy has published four books of narrative nonfiction, most recently, Harley and Me, Embracing Risk on the Road to a More Authentic Life, a hybrid narrative that combines memoir with research into neuroscience and biology. The book explores female risk-taking through the lens of her own experience of learning to ride a motorcycle at age 48 and makes a compelling case for how and why taking risks is a healthy part of an expansive life. Thank you so much, and let's welcome her in. Cool. Technical difficulties, I'm dropping the mic already. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. It feels funny being mic'd when we're a small, intimate group, but um, that's how it is. Uh, thank you to Long Beach City College for having me here. Uh, just so I know who's here, tell me, if, raise your hand if you're a creative writer. Cool, so almost everyone here. And um, what if you're just someone who really loves reading and books? Okay, good. So um, I'm going to read a little bit from the book. I'm going to talk a little bit about the writing process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my career as a writer and how I got to where I am in case you're someone who's interested in making a similar path. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm a product of the California Community College system. I attended Glendale Community College years and years and years ago. And, um, and it was a great experience for me. So I, I want to focus on that for just a minute before I read, because it gave me the start and put me on the path to where I am now. Um, when I went to college, my parents were immigrants from Ireland. And neither one of them had gone to college. And they thought that going to college was something reserved for sort of fancy people. And we weren't fancy people. So they did not um, make any plans for us to go to college or think about us going to college. Um, and my older brother happened to go to the local community college, and so I just followed his path. But when I went to college, I thought, well, the whole point of this was to get a job. So I started looking at careers. I first started with nursing, and I was really bad at nursing, so I, that did not last very long. And then um, I, I was trying on different careers. I tried um, a quantity food preparation, like to be a chef, and I did that for a while because I was looking for sort of a, a, a blue collar way of being in the world. And it wasn't until I was in my um, English class and the professor noticed that I was good at writing and asked me to tutor for his students because he needed someone to do that. And I told him I was having all this trouble. I was failing chemistry. I was not, you know, I was not finding my way. And he said to me, have you ever thought about being a writer? And I thought, are you kidding? You know, that's like saying, have you ever thought about being president of the United States or being an astronaut? It was something that never had crossed my mind because it was such a high aspiration. I thought, there's no way, you can't do that. So I asked him about, like, you know, really people can just decide they want to be a writer and be a writer, you know? And he said, yeah, you can, you can absolutely do that. So um, it was the first time, and you know, here I was like 20 years old, and it was the first time it had ever crossed my mind that I could do something like that. I knew that I could write, I had always written. The way I got through life as a kid, I had a very uh, tumultuous upbringing, was I would take my hang 10 notebooks, anyone remember hang 10 notebooks, um, into the bathroom with me. We had, um, I had five siblings, so there were seven of us living in a house with one bathroom, and the only time I could get privacy was to go into the bathroom and lock the door and take a bath. So I'd take my hang 10 notebook in the bathtub with me and lean over the edge and just journal. And um, that was my way of sort of dealing with what was going on in life and just a way of um, walking myself through what was happening. I didn't think of it as a skill or as something that could be a career. It was a coping mechanism. And um, when this professor said to me, have you ever thought about being a writer, it, it, something clicked in my head. And I found myself on the path that has become the rest of my life, basically. I'm really grateful for that. I have worked as a writer in almost every way possible. I have been a journalist, I have been a PR writer, I have been a ghost writer, I've written 
grants. I have been a book critic for the Los Angeles Times. I've been a journalist. I have um, written my own books. I have written just about anything you could come up with, I can write. And so I knew that about myself. I initially um, did my undergrad in journalism because after this gentleman said to me, you could possibly be a writer, I thought, well, I don't know what I want to write. I was still pretty young. I didn't have a sense of who I was in the world. But I knew if you gave me an assignment, I could totally pull that off. So if I became a journalist, you know, an editor would give me the assignment and then I could do that. So I did my undergrad degree in journalism with a minor in English. I went into public relations and advertising copywriting. And I did that for a number of years and made a, a lot more money then doing that than I have subsequently made as a, as a creative writer. Um, but at a certain point, I decided I had stories that I wanted to tell that were important to me. And I didn't want to just be given assignments. I now wanted to tell things that mattered um, in my gut. So I went back to school and did an MFA in creative writing. Um, I'm now a professor. I, in fact, I run the creative nonfiction department at Antioch University for their MFA program. I brought bookmarks here if anyone's interested. We have the graduate program, but we also have a bachelor's completion program that has a creative writing concentration. Um, there's a bunch of other concentrations as well, but if you're interested when you finish at this college in f continuing on to get a bachelor's degree, it's one option, and I brought some flyers for that. So I went back to school with, as a mother of three young children, my youngest was two years old, and I went back to school and did my MFA, and I decided I really wanted to write stuff that mattered to me. And in that program, I learned how to write fiction. I actually did a degree in fiction writing, not creative nonfiction, um, but I practiced a lot of different skills. By the time I graduated, I had done a field study in book reviewing, because I was really fascinated with book reviewing. And I knew that every time I read a book and analyzed how it worked and what went into it, I knew more about how to do it in my own work. So I did this field study in book reviewing, and by the time I graduated, I was writing for newspapers across the country back in the day when we had book reviews sections in newspapers, and then was hired by the LA Times to be a weekly book critic for them shortly after that. Um, so the path kept getting clearer and clearer on how to um, make a living as a writer, how to um, do my own books. This is my fourth book. Um, how to find the stories that I was interested in and how to use the skills that I had been taught in order to create things. Um, so if you're sitting there thinking, you know, I'd really like to be a writer, but that's something reserved, like being a movie star, something out there that only those few who are touched specially get to do this, I want to tell you that's not true. That just hard work, putting the time in, spending time to learn the craft, that there's stories that need to be told, and you may have those stories that are not being told um, in the larger culture, that the larger culture doesn't know about the things that you want to tell us about, that if you learn how to harness the power of language and how to use the language to tell the stories in a way that c get people interested, then those stories can explode on the, the surface of what's going on in our culture in a way that will wake people up. So I encourage you, if you're thinking about that, please do not give up that dream. And know that there are a lot of voices that are not being heard that I, I'd love for them to be part of the conversation. So I really encourage you to um, do that. So I'm going to start by reading a little bit of the beginning of this book. And then, um, then I'll talk some more, then I'll read a little more, and then I'll take questions. Um, so this book is Harley and Me, and it's the story of me learning how to ride a motorcycle at 48 and how it turned my life on its head. Uh, it started because when I fell in love with this motorcycle that I wanted to buy and subsequently bought, my first thought was, how can I write this off? <laughs> and that if I write a book on it, I can write, I can, it becomes a tax deduction that I can legitimately say I bought this motorcycle for a reason other than I'm having a midlife crisis. Um, so I decided to do it based on that, and that's how it started, but it ended up becoming a rich learning experience for me. So the prologue is where, in a book, if you structure it the way I did this, we want to get the reader hooked into the story and have them have questions and be curious in order to then unfold the rest of the story. So this prologue is pretty short, but the idea is to set up the story so that you're curious to see how did, how did this happen. So it starts with um, a quote from T.S. Eliot, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. The day is finally starting to soften with the onset of evening as a storm assembles itself to the southeast. 
The sun has been scorching my retinas all day and is just now starting to dim. I've been riding my motorcycle more than eight hours today, winding first through the stunning canyons of Utah, veering into Idaho for a bit, and now entering the spectacular open range of western Wyoming. My forearms are leaden, my shoulders sag. I vaguely remember the tasteless lunch I ate hours ago, but now I'm hungry. The air is hot, even hotter inside the road armor I'm wearing. I am saddle sore, and it is only day two. Rebecca and I are trekking by motorcycle from Los Angeles to Milwaukee and back, a 16-day, 5,000-mile adventure, the first extended road trip for either of us. We originally met in the mommy realm, room parents together at a small parochial grade school our kids attended. Now our children are mostly grown, and both of us have only recently left long-term marriages. Having fled the cocoon of the suburban world we'd long inhabited, we find ourselves at midlife, crossing the country on motorcycles, unsure of the road ahead, but determined to move forward anyhow. Before we left, we faced questions to our sanity and the, uh, uh, excuse me, and the opposition of loved ones. You're packing heat, asked Levi, one of the salesmen at Harley Davidson of Glendale, more a statement than a question. No, we are not packing heat. We are packing Lara bars, ibuprofen, lip balm, and hair scrunchies. We're two women eager to see the country on motorcycles, aware that we don't know jack about what we're doing and that we might need to depend on others along the way. Still, we're tentatively confident we can navigate what lives ahead. Day two seems interminable. How could it not yet be nighttime when we've been going and going for so long that we are well past all reserves of endurance we thought we possessed? For this early leg of the journey, we joined up with a couple we know from home. Edna and George, both seasoned cross-country riders, take the lead. Their presence emboldened us to leave the main highway earlier today, east of Salt Lake, and take a more scenic but lightly traveled route to Jackson Hole. We filled our gas tanks 30 minutes ago in a tiny town, a cluster of thick-set adobe buildings that seem to be holdovers from the late 1800s. Since then, we haven't encountered a soul. We are still an hour and a half out of Jackson. My body gives off a pungent tang of sweat, and my hands have lost feeling from grasping the clutch and brake levers all day. I dream of pulling off my stiff road pants, stripping the layers of salt glazed shirts <clears throat> and under things, followed by a meal, a real sit-down meal, not ordered from a takeout window, as we rest our tired bodies while crunching chips with salsa and waiting for our tamales to be served or spoon up spicy Thai goodness, or chow down on veggie burgers and sweet potato fries. The food doesn't matter, only its promise. The monotony of the road has become so hypnotic, it takes me a moment to realize that Edna has pulled off on the shoulder. Rebecca slows behind her. George and I turn our bikes back to see what's up. A fringe of prairie June grass forms wispy boundaries on either shoulder of the empty highway. Crows call out and the wind sighs. The magnificent nowhere of Wyoming takes away my breath. Getting off the motorcycle, little explosions of pain detonate in my hips and back. My joints feel fused by so many hours crouched on the frame of a bike. Twisting the full-faced helmet from my sweat-drenched head is an amazing relief, as is the abrupt lack of vibration and the now-silenced roar of the pipes. Riding all day and then stopping is like stepping off a boat and being instantly aware that the swell of the waves has ceased. I locate my supply of trail mix from the pack strapped to my sissy bar before I go over to investigate. Excuse me. Rebecca edges next to me. Edna has a flat, she says, the front tire. That doesn't sound so bad. A call to the auto club and we'll be on our way again. But George is already dialing his cell phone and unable to get service. Rebecca tries hers, and the screen shows zero bars. The situation begins to take on a new clarity. Unlike a car, Rebecca explains, a motorcycle flat is not an easy roadside fix. We obviously aren't carrying spares, and the tow truck driver will not be carrying one either. Besides, changing a motorcycle tire is like surgery. If repairing a car flat is an outpatient procedure, with a motorcycle, we're talking organ transplant. 
There's no question, Edna's bike will have to be flatbedded to a town. That is, if we can get a cell phone signal to call for help. George carries a Harley road guide and asks Rebecca to look for the nearest dealer that can provide motorcycle service while he continues trying to connect with the auto club. Soon, she's shaking her head. There isn't a single Harley service department within a 100-mile radius. Rebecca, George, Edna, and I sit on the side of the soft ray shoulder, sharing trail mix. A fence runs parallel to the road, tilting and collapsing in places, breaking down from neglect. It's obvious no cattle have grazed this plain in ages. The motorcycle pipes and cylinder heads tick as they cool. Shadows from the cotton white clouds model the landscape. Scanning the 360 degree countryside, it's all sky and grasslands, everything vast beyond comprehension. Not a car or another soul in sight. I've been backpacking to remote peaks in the high Sierra, out of reach of cell phone service and human convenience. But that was by intent. This was not part of the plan. We consider our options. Rebecca and I can ride until we get a cell phone signal, or we can all stay together and hope that one of our phones will pick up a signal soon. Meanwhile, though, the inky clouds to the southeast tumble in our direction. A curtain of rain pelts the low hills in the distance. We all carry rain suits, but are not anxious to try them out. As we debate possibilities, a loud crack splits the silence. It sounds more like the compact ballistic report of a rifle than the rolling clap of thunder. We look to George. Was that a gun? Could be hunting season, he speculates, eyebrows lifted. Or maybe there's a shooting range nearby. The sharp cracks come more frequently. Multiple shooters. Whoever they are, they seem to be moving closer. We all go by certain assumptions that we live in a largely civil, law-abiding society. Still, it's hard not to flash back on the final scenes of Easy Rider with its denouement of casual, explosive violence against the free-spirited, live-and-let-live cross-country riders. But that was only a movie, right? Right? I glance at Rebecca for a reassuring look that will confirm I'm overreacting, but her widened eyes and the taut set of her jaw tell me she's frightened, too. It comes back to me how casually I dismissed Levi at the dealership and his earnest assumption that we were packing heat. Did he understand something about the open road we have blithely dismissed? I turn to Rebecca again. We had agreed to do this trip together. Now what? The exhaustion has so drained my reserves that I no longer trust my judgment. I am hungry, sore, and running well past empty. Am I crazy to be here in the first place? Sitting on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, we watch the storm on a direct path towards us while each volley of gunshots gets closer and louder. How in the world did I get to this place and why? So um, that sets up the, the main theme of the book. You know, how does someone who is, you know, a suburban, boring, mom of three, professor of creative writing, living in, you know, a totally suburban area, end up on a motorcycle on a cross-country journey with, like, you know, doing crazy stuff, um, which opens the book up to research. I ended up doing a lot of research in this book. My history, which is explained in the book, is that my mother was severely mentally ill. She was um, manic depressive, bipolar, institutionalized a lot throughout my childhood, and never sort of had a full life. So I grew up believing and always being afraid, what if that happens to me too, because this was in the family. So after having a very normal, placid, straight sort of life for all these years, the fact that I'm suddenly wearing leather and on a bike and doing all this stuff, I started thinking, it's coming to get me. Maybe this is craziness, you know, and I wasn't sure. So I started looking into risk. What is risk good for us? What, what causes us to take risks, particular as we, particularly as we age? We know why young people take risks, but why and how might it be helpful later in life? And I started talking to neuroscientists and biologists and um, sociologists and a neuroeconomist and all kinds of people to find out, is it OK that I'm doing this? Like, someone tell me it's OK that I'm not losing my mind, that I've not gone around the bend. And so then I started weaving all the research into risk taking into the book. So that what I wanted this book to be was not so much about, here's this one woman who does this thing, but about how and why risk can be a helpful, uh, expansive part of any life at any age, as long as we're careful 
careful to not do risky stuff that's going to get us killed or injured or whatever, that, uh, being careful about it. <coughs> So I ended up talking to a lot of experts. At one point, I had my blood taken before and after riding the motorcycle to find out what happened with a series of hormones um, in the body. Um, it was not a proper study because I was the only one that we did it with, but we were able to track what happened with cortisol, which is the hormone that um, when you have stress, with um, oxytocin, which is the cuddle um, hormone that when you're holding a baby or petting a dog or um, kissing someone or having sex, you have a lot of oxytocin. Um, and what was the third one? Uh, now I'm drawing a blank on what the third. In any case, we, we looked at those three um, uh, hormones to see what happened with riding the motorcycle. So I got to do some research. I got to go ask these questions I wanted to ask. I got to talk to different experts in order to find the answers to my question. But in order to frame all that information, if I made it just a straightforward nonfiction book, it would be here's a bunch of information about uh, why and how risk is, can be good for you. Um, and it would just have a lot of facts and a lot of da data. But I wanted you to become caught up in the story in order to then be interested in the science that I presented. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit more. What time, how are we on time? Great. OK. I'm going to read a little bit more from now from chapter one. So we, we started with the prologue, which is sort of in the middle of things. Things are, there's a problem here. We're stuck somewhere. And now we're going to back up in time to find out how did I get to that place, which was the question that's set up. And by the way, I want to mention about this book that not only does it involve the motorcycle, before the book's over, I moved to Tahiti for three months. I learned to um, open water. Uh, paddle across um, the ocean between the island of Tahiti and the island of Morea. I learned to scuba dive, and I learned to rock and ice climb. So there's a lot of different kinds of risk taking that takes place in the book. So if you're interested in risk as a whole, but not too into the motorcycle, just know that there are other things that go into it as well. So this is from chapter one, staring into the eyes of the beast. And it, too, starts with a quote. In life, it's rarely about getting a chance, but about taking one. I'll take this off. For some, it starts with a smile from a gorgeous stranger across the room, eyes hooded and enticing, an attraction that cannot be denied. Think Anna Karenina or Madame Bovary. For others, a website for a mountain climbing expedition keeps calling you back, baiting, tempting you, a thrum underneath daily life that won't go away. This is crazy, you think, but you continue returning to the web page or the stranger's eyes, staring and daydreaming. The desire for excitement is sometimes little more than a whisper. You can't explain it, but you've always wanted to swim with dolphins or learn to speak Mandarin. Thelma and Louise started out as a simple road trip, a weekend getaway. Maybe you'll begin to waken when you finally sign up for that oil painting class or take those singing lessons or buy those ballet slippers. Or maybe you just get so tired of being scared by life that you decide to stare down the beast and challenge it. For me, the beast is a motorcycle. So there's this opening in my Writer's Edge class that starts tomorrow night. My close friend and running partner, Rebecca, says one Wednesday in August. I have only mentioned in passing my very slight interest in taking the motorcycle safety class Rebecca's dealership offers. It's a complete fluke she even remembers. Rebecca has recently taken over the ownership of the Harley dealer her father founded 35 years earlier. On our regular runs, we discuss everything. Our kids, stubborn issues with parents or siblings, our troubled marriages, our careers, our dreams and desires. We have bonded by a need to experience life more fully, to step out of our roles as mothers, wives, and women, to pursue a future for ourselves unburdened by stereotypes and pre preconceptions. During one of our runs, I mentioned that I'm doing research for a novel. Wouldn't it be fun to write a female character who rides a motorcycle? I can pump Rebecca for information about bikes, but if I also take the class, I'll be able to describe the experience with more authority. I have no idea that saying yes to this course will completely upend my life. The next evening, I find myself in the Harley-Davidson Writer's Edge class, three nights in a classroom and two full days in the saddle of an actual motorcycle. I figure I'll learn how to do this one quirky thing have a funny little anecdote to share at cocktail parties, and enough information to write my character. For one weekend, I will live a tiny bit on the edge. After that, I can pull back to my safe zone. In the midst of the second writer's edge class, my cell phone vibrates. I ignore it. 
The group of 11 students and I are standing around a large sheet of paper taped to the wall with a stick person sketch of a motorcycle. We draw slips of paper from a helmet with words like throttle, rear brake, speedometer, and clutch on them, taking turns identifying where those components are located. I correctly identify the turn signal cancel switch and feel a little jolt of excitement. I'm starting to get it when the phone vibrates again. I pull it from my back pocket to check who's calling so insistently. It's my brother, Brendan. I excuse myself and step into the hallway to take the call. What's up, I ask. Dad's worse, Brendan says, and I can't take this much longer. I was here last night and I'll be here again tonight, but I'm at the end of my rope. We'll need someone to stay with him Saturday night and Sunday too. Can you set up something? We've all been taking turns visiting and staying with Dad, who's in home hospice care. He's 90, has bile duct cancer, and lives an hour away from any of us. My stepmother, Jean, 82, has been getting no sleep. Since Dad needs to be physically lifted during the night to use the bathroom, the men from the family have been staying with him, while my sister and I are out there regularly helping however we can. I make calls for the next 10 minutes standing in the hallway, missing class, arranging for family members to take turns staying the night with Dad. I return to the class and try to pick up the lesson. I force myself to concentrate. But one question repeats, what the hell am I doing in a class to learn how to ride a motorcycle while my father is dying? After class, I call my friend Kitty. This is insane, isn't it? I should drop everything and get out to dad's house. You've been out there every chance you can. There's no knowing how this will unfold, she says. When you get quiet inside, what do you feel you need to do? I don't know, I haven't felt quiet inside lately. That's your first job then. Let everything settle and see how you feel. I follow Kitty's suggestions, sitting silently for 20 minutes. After, I feel revitalized. I've made a clear decision. Unless I feel a definite prompt to run out to Dad's house or I'm asked to help, I'm going to stick with the class. By deciding to take the motorcycle class, I realize I'm after something more than an organic high. I want to remind myself that I am strong and capable. I've been taught that I should be afraid of big, muscular things like a motorcycle. As a woman, I've been programmed to believe I'm too delicate emotionally and physically to handle a machine so demanding. Some part of me knows that's not true. I can do things that frighten me. In doing so, I hope to discover that I am strong enough to survive the approaching loss of my father the only real parent I've ever known. I drive the 15 minutes from my house in the suburban foothills into the city looking for the Costco Best Buy parking lot. Hidden behind these superstores is an even larger parking lot used by Glendale Harley as its training range. My fellow students gather near a large metal storage building with a rigged up sunshade. Three lines of four motorcycles each are queued up and waiting. My heart hammers. I've spent the past two evenings doing the book learning part necessary, but somehow I didn't think about this next step, actually getting on a motorcycle. I've got to ride one of those damn things. I examine my fellow students. The three other women in the class are outfitted in Harley gear, leather jackets, black half helmets, tight fitting sequin tank tops, and kick-ass boots. Our faces are going to be enclosed in helmets in 90 degree weather, and yet two of the women are wearing makeup. The guys are almost as decked out. Most wear boots and leather jackets. The youngest guy in the class, who has yet to touch the starter button on a bike, has just bought a designer leather jacket along with a $400 helmet already wired with Bluetooth. The corporate looking guy from Santa Monica, who confessed last night that he was taking this class while his wife is out of town, is carrying a new modular flip up helmet. If his wife finds out, he says, she's going to kill him. I wonder what he where he plans to hide the helmet. And me, I'm in baggy men's Levi's 501s, a stained t-shirt, gardening gloves, and hiking boots. I look more like the hired hand than a biker chick. At this moment, I'd love a pair of killer motorcycle boots. I pick out a helmet and our instructors, Mario and Kathy, review the safety rules and then assign us each a bike. We will be riding Buell Blasts, yellow or black, 492 cc bikes manufactured by a division of Harley, the standard trainers for first time riders in this course. 
The plastic bodywork pieces covering the bikes are made from surlin. Excuse me. It's a substance used on the outside of golf balls, which gives you some idea of the kind of beating they are designed to take. The side view mirrors have been removed, and the tail lights are cheap plastic expected to be replaced. They say there are only two kinds of bikers in this world, those who have put down a bike and those who are waiting to do so. This is not comforting. I am assigned a black motorcycle number 16. Finally, we are told to mount our bikes. I've ridden on the back of a motorcycle before. In my late teens, I dated a guy with a Honda Rebel and rode around LA and up and down Angeles Crest Highway, a twisty mountain road notorious for the number of motorcycle accidents there. The Sheriff's Department's life flight helicopters practically run a shuttle between the winding crest and the trauma centers down on the flats. No helmet, no safety gear. Those were the days before California's mandatory helmet laws. I was young and felt nothing bad could happen. I was lucky then, but now I am too old to believe myself invincible. So riding by myself now, not as a passenger, but the driver? I swing my right leg over the saddle and sit. When instructed, I turn the handlebars to straighten the wheel. I lean the bike to an upright position and sweep away the kickstand. I stand, straddling a machine that weighs 360 pounds and rock it gently side to side beneath me. I feel every ounce of the bike's weight and heft, a gravity I didn't expect that makes the hairs on the base of my neck bristle. I touch the starter button and the engine fires. It seems to want to do whatever I might ask it to do, friendly, even eager to please. There is something mystical about the moment, as if I've been handed powers. I am sitting on this machine that can go and go fast at my slightest touch. It's intoxicating and terrifying. Soon we learn to walk our bikes in first gear across the asphalt, pushing them at the end of each lap to turn them. And then, before we know it, we're riding. Just little jaunts, but we're moving, and our feet are off the ground and on the pegs. My fear has been that I won't be strong enough to keep the bike upright. How will I maneuver a machine that weighs three times my body weight? But physical strength isn't the key. It's more about agility and coordination, nimbleness and vigilance, and a little bit of courage. When the morning breaks arrives, we're all jubilant. Everyone figured out how to ride. No one flunked out. Mario and Kathy call us into the shade and ask us to record our thoughts about riding a motorcycle for the first time. I write a sentence or two and then step behind the storage building to call Dad. For the past two hours, it's been a relief not second-guessing whether I should have gone out there this morning. Attempting something new and scary focused me, crowding out all other thoughts. I talk with my stepmom and hear that dad is much the same, very weak, hardly able to stand, much less walk. I speak to him and tell him that I love him. I don't mention that I'm learning to ride a motorcycle this weekend, that I've chosen to do this rash and perilous thing rather than come visit. And now my brief moment of triumph has been replaced by shame. A month after I pass the motorcycle safety class, I receive my M1 endorsement on my D from the DMV on my driver's license. And a month after that, death arrives. After sitting at my father's bedside for a week, going home at night to grab a few hours of sleep, praying for his peaceful passing, feeling awe and frustration at how the body hangs on by its cracked and bloodied fingernails long after the spirit has begged for rest, I get the call at 5 a.m. I drive numb to his home in Thousand Oaks. I bathe his lifeless body with the help of the hospice nurse, startled at how small and shrunken he has become. This man who in life both adored and terrified me, now reduced to a cooling, fleshy bag of bones. When the mortuary men put him on the gurney, I ask them to wait a few minutes while I touch his face, hold his hand, and whisper my goodbye. The next day, I walk into the Harley dealership and buy myself a two-year-old, all-black, Sportster Iron 883 motorcycle. An example of grief made manifest? Absolutely. It is also a full-throated, I'm sorry, full-hearted embrace of life. So um, the book then continues on with weaving back and forth between, I didn't read you the, any of the science parts, but we get into the science stuff, 
and then so I go cross country and then I once I did that it was like all bets are off I can do anything so then I moved to Tahiti I, I was on sabbatical from my job at the university and just started trying different things to find out what um, resonated with me in my heart what were the, the activities I wanted to participate in for me when I started to ride the motorcycle I really didn't expect to love it. I thought I was doing it just to um, gather the information for this um, character. And when it became something I loved, it, uh, it raised the question in me, if I could love a motorcycle that I never thought I'd have any interest in, what other things in life might I love that I've just never tried? I've been too afraid to try, I've been too hesitant, I've been worried about what it would look like, you know, all the things that I hadn't done. So then I started to try all those things and have different experiences to find more closely what aligned with me as a human and what I wanted. And how oh, we're doing good. Um, so those were the parts that I prepared to read. Uh, I'd love to uh, have a discussion with you if you have questions, and I'm happy to talk about um, careers as writers, if you're interested in that, about creative nonfiction and how it works and how it's different from other types of literature, or um, MFA programs, if you're thinking of things like that, or whatever. So is this a good time to open to questions? Okay, great. Um, anyone got a question? I'd like you to speak about Thank um, you. what you think it is a requirement to get an MFA or to be. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. So the question is whether you really need an MFA to be a writer. No, you don't. Um, absolutely, you do not. I know many friends who are excellent, outstanding writers. I thank you. Um, who don't have an MFA. What I will say is, if as a writer you wish to also teach to help support your writing, then having an MFA comes in really handy. Um, because to be a professor, you need to have a PhD or an MFA usually um, in creative writing. Uh, that said. Taking, being part of an MFA program for me, I learned in two years what I probably would have learned on my own over 10 years. So if you are very serious as a writer and you really want to sort of jump start it, the, the number of writers I met, the way people took my hands and led me through, this is how you put together an entire book. You know, I had a friend tell me once, I, I'm a big knitter. So my first two books were on knitting. So I've gone from knitting to motorcycles, go figure. But um, she was, we were talking about the difficulty of writing a novel. And she, at one point, says writing a novel is like knitting an argyle sock. And an argyle sock has, you know, colors changing and patterns changing. It's very complicated. I'm like, okay, an argyle sock, I could do that. And she goes, no, an argyle sock the size of a football field. And I'm like, Okay, now I'm starting to see how, how big and complicated this can be. So an MFA program was very helpful in teaching me the, the skills I needed organizationally and as a writer craft-wise on how to put my ideas into play to make it shape to be a longer narrative. So, um, but no, you, you absolutely do not need one to be a very successful writer. Yes, sir. Can you think off the top of your head writers who don't have an MFA and have published in Oh, absolutely. I would say a huge portion of them don't have, not a huge, probably less than 50% now because it's become so popular. But like one of my dear friends, David Newland, is the former book critic for the LA Times. Um, is teaching now at USC and with me um, and at UC Riverside. He's never gotten an MFA. He's published a number of books. Uh, a lot of it has to do with you know, the ability to do the writing. If you can do the writing, and you can get someone who wants to represent it and sell the writing, whether it's your agent and the editor who acquires the book. They don't care. If you're, if you're approaching an agent or an editor and you say, I have an MFA, they don't care about that. They, want to, they care about what's on the pages. So um, absolutely, yeah, there's tons of them out there. Let me ask you writing this important. I wish I could say I, I was. I aspire to that. When I'm working on a project, I'm much more disciplined. Um, I am working on a project right now, but I'm also balancing it with about four other things. And I ha have the terminal flaw of when I've got work to do for other people, I'll tend to prize that over my own work. So I'm working really hard to change that and to try to get up in the morning and do my two, two. My, what I try to do with myself is two hours or a thousand words a day when I'm being good about my discipline. Um, and then once I've hit either of those markers, if I got a thousand words done in the first hour, I'm off the hook, you know, I can go do something else. 
Um, but if I, it's one of those days where I'm eking out words, if I put in two hours and I'm like, okay, you're free to go. And then I put my other work around it. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm good at talking about it. When I have a book that's on deadline, this has been my issue. I've sold four books to publishers based on proposals. So I've got someone waiting for the book. When I've got someone waiting for the book and they've already given me money for it, then I'm more likely to do it. When I'm just, right now I'm working on a novel, I have no contract for it, I'm just having fun with it, you can call it that, <laughs> torture with it. Um, so it's, it's been harder for me to um, be as good about that discipline. Yes? Can you talk about a reason about your feelings about the craft of writing and whether you knew you could write before you actually learned the craft and before you got your first assignment. Good question. Sense? Yeah, I knew I could write. Um, and, I, and part of it was from sitting with those hang 10 notebooks. And I just spent a lot of time, you know, they talk about the 10,000 hour thing, that you have to do something like 10,000 hours to even approach being some level of mastery in it. I had spent years and years and years writing. So, so when this English professor told me he wanted me to tutor for him because I was so good at this, I kind of already knew I was good at it. It's one of those things that I actually dismissed because I was good at it. I, like, I thought everyone, that it was easy because it was easy for me. And I think that a lot of that came from osmosis. I read like a fiend growing up and that was the thing that kept me sane. So when you read a lot, you, you start to understand story structure and how it works and, and it just part, becomes part of so your bloodstream. So when it came time to write something, I had all that backstory of all these books I had ever read that informed me. Now that said, once I started, I knew I could write decent sentences, I could construct things, but there was still a ton for me to learn. When I, in my MFA program, I learned so much. To give you an example, before I took the MFA program, I had tried to write a novel. And um, I wrote the first draft and got it from the beginning to the end, and the only way I could think of to tell the story was chronologically. By the time I graduated two years later, I could come up with like 30 different ways I could construct that story. Because now I had all these tools that I didn't have before. And I knew which tool to use for what. And, and I could make decisions so I didn't have to write it 30 different times to try to figure out how I wanted to do it. It was a little more clear to me because of um, the training I got in craft. But I do think on some level, I, I always knew I could write. Does that answer the question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Did you ever have the um, that thing in your stomach where you just want to run ahead anyway? You know, like just sort of um, this is. Uh, it's like you you have that feeling that you can write, mm -hmm. and you just want to run ahead and write. You know, and you know the MFA things over here and mm -hmm. all the other stuffs over here, but you just want to run ahead, right? Did you ever have that? I'm not sure. I know that I, I was writing for quite a few years, so I was in my 30s before I went back for my MFA. So I've been working for uh, 10 years as a writer in one form or another by the time I went back for my MFA. Um, and at that point, I started taking classes at UCLA Extension. And they have some really good classes for people who are very serious about their writing. Um, but it was like being a starving person and being given a little bit of soup every, you know, once a week. I needed more, and it was that experience that told me, oh, I need a full-time program that, that I can be fully immersed in this, because I felt I had taken what was my natural abilities as far as I could, and I couldn't go any further. So now I needed, um, I needed direction from outside to help me make the next step. Is that, is that OK, good. Anyone back there? Anyone's writing something? Yes. Well, you're a second rep. What keeps you going through? I'm stuck in a rut, what keeps me motivated? I have this sense that there are certain things I'm supposed to write. It's almost like this obligation. I feel the weight of an obligation to get certain things done. And there's times when I just totally like do not want to do it. And, um, and I've tried to escape it a few times by like saying, okay, forget it, I'm not gonna write that, and I'm done, you know, forget you. And then it just keeps coming back. And if, it, if it's like got you by the throat and you know it, you've got no choice, at least I've got no choice, but to finally say, I, this is sort of the thing that's been given to me. Writers, um, I wish I was a different writer. I read other people's stuff and I'm like, that's the kind of writer I want to be. I'm not that writer, you know? And I, that isn't my story. I have, I've been given certain stories and those are mine. 
And um, as much as I wish they were other ones, sometimes they're not. And I, the more I acknowledge that, the more it becomes clear, oh, yeah, I got to do this project. So, and it, it, there are times when it's joyful on the days when um, I've done my two hours and the time has flown by and I've made some progress and I didn't struggle overly much. On those days, I feel ecstatic when I'm done. And that's the, the joy in it. And then there's other days where it's just like having a job. You know, I'm just going to get my butt in the chair and stay there and struggle and write some really awful stuff. And maybe tomorrow I'll have an idea how to fix the awfulness I created today. Um, and that's just part of the process. Sure. Yes? Uh, you said uh, early on in your career, when you chose journalism, uh, that it was because you felt it easier to work on something if someone gave you an assignment. Yes. Was it because of a lack of discipline? Was it just something that you just hadn't found your voice? Or I think it's, it's, there's a number of things. Uh, like I'm doing, I'm doing some writing right now that is more assigned as well as my own work because at a certain point I get sick of my own stories. I get sick of what I know to talk about and yet I have enough writing time and energy that would feel good to be using it for something else. So I'm actually moving back into a realm. I'm, doing, I'm working on two books as a book collaborator right now where it's someone who is sort of famous in the world needs help putting together this book. It's not my story, but I have the skills that can help create the story this person's trying to tell. And I like that because I don't have to sit down and think, what do I want to write today? Like the hardest thing for me is to decide what is it I'm trying to write. And if someone else can decide that, the writing part, I find much easier. So um, I do both now, um, probably because having written four books now and probably I know a couple hundred essays that have gone out into the world and some short stories. I've written a lot of the stories I felt that were driving me so much before. Um, I'm still working on this novel that is still driving me. But beyond that, I don't feel the same um, burden with those stories um, that I could think of right now that I felt earlier. And I have more fun sometimes with someone else's story. So I do both. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, um, so before this panel, I was never really familiar with the concept, uh, the concept of creative non-writing. Usually, the average person, when they think of creative writing, uh, uh, they just think, uh, well, fiction or something to pass the time. But I, I was never, uh, today I, I learned that you can write creatively while writing about uh, like real experiences. Yeah. And so and that question that popped uh, in my mind right during the panel was if, uh, Creative non-writing is mostly biographical or autobiographical. So a really good question, and I'll explain sort of how the genres work. So fiction is where you're making up stuff, and it's usually kind of wholesale made up. In the old days, there in the old days, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there would be a number of novels published that were called novels, but they were basically thinly veiled personal stories. So you could have an autobiographical story, you would call it a novel, and it would be sold as a novel. Because nonfiction was biographies of famous people, or scientific books, or books with data in them. And there was sort of a divide between the two. Then a book came along uh, in the 80s, uh, The Liar's Club by uh, Carr, Mary Carr. And that was the first book to really bridge this divide. And she brought in the skills of a poet to tell a personal story and to do it in a nonfiction way. So um, since that book, there's been an explosion of the genre of creative nonfiction. Um, did you see the movie Wild, or did you hear that last year? It was the story of the woman who hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. She was actually a colleague of mine, and that's a perfect example of where you take a story that happened, something that happened to me, and, and make it into the, something that reads like a novel, has the same sort of arc as a novel, but it's all based in truth. Um, then there becomes a lot of question between, can you play with the truth at all when you're doing it? Because if it's creative nonfiction, well, can't I just sort of kill off two of my siblings and make gunshots go off here? Which, like, by the way, in that scene where there's gunshots, those are real gunshots. I can't make that up. We're not sort of, as nonfiction writers, allowed to do really make up stuff, but we can, um, we can take certain liberties, but um, it's a way of using the, the tools of a fiction writer to tell a story that's a true story. Mm -hmm. And it can involve a personal story, but it can also involve uh, a lot of research stuff. 
um, looking into something. The uh, Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks mm -hmm. is a great example. Fabulous book. The book was so much better than the movie. I got to say, if you haven't read the book, read the book. Um, it's all based in facts and science, but it's so compelling you can't put it down. Or um, John Krakauer was into thin air about the um, uh, deaths on Mount Everest, an Everest expedition that went bad and a bunch of people died. Um, it's all truthful, but it's told in a way that reads like a novel. So you, you become very interested in, in the characters. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah um, it just came to me that uh, a story that I was working on, um, that it does fall into that category because uh, of, of what you said about the um, yeah, liars, about the person who bridges that gap. You're really just telling a story. It's just a true story. And you know, I've been, so I teach in this MFA program, I head up the creative nonfiction department, and I've been advocating for years we should get rid of the distinction between nonfiction and fiction because it's all creative writing. It's all prose writing that is meant to tell a story. Um, I think the distinction comes into play when it comes time to market the book. Does it go on the fiction or nonfiction table? We had a, um, the James Fry incident, what was that, five, six years ago, um, the guy who wrote A Million Little Pieces was on the Oprah show. It was this really dramatic um, memoir of getting, getting so clean and sober that turns out it was really sort of all fiction. Um, but he marketed it as nonfiction, and that created this big hoopla about it. Um, and the thing was, when you write nonfiction, they will usually put a fact checker to make sure that the facts are straight. But they didn't bother fact checking this because the only person he was libeling or making look bad was himself. So they let him get away with it. And then when it came out that he had made it up um, or made up big portions of it, it became a big deal. But as far as I'm concerned, a good story is a good story. So, um, and from a craft standpoint, you use many of the exact same tools that a fiction writer would use to tell a nonfiction story, but you know where the boundaries are between what's true and what's made up, and you, you respect those boundaries. Would you say that the New Yorker has some better written creative? Uh, Absolutely, uh, and fiction, and yeah, yeah, some of the best writing around is taking place there, yeah. Did you have a question? Um, were you always risk averse, or was this uh, something that you kind of suppressed for convention? Or? I, I became risk averse, so I was more of a risk taker when I was younger. I was a competitive skateboarder in my teens, um, and kind of hung out with all the guys and tried to do the more edgy stuff. And then I had kids, I got married and had kids, and there was something about that process that made me more and more risk averse. And this, this biological imperative to make sure I was safe to care for the next generation. And um, recognizing how that's a helpful, good thing, and yet it has its limits. And that because of that biological imperative, I had made my life smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, where I was afraid to take very basic risks. So in learning to ride the motorcycle, it got me to sort of break out of that and learn to trust that it was OK to do things that I don't know how it's going to work out, but that it, I could have an experience. It might be a good experience, it might be a bad experience, but it was OK to go have experiences rather than think about them ahead of time and say, oh, but that could happen and that could happen. It's better, I shouldn't do anything, you know, and try to be a little more open to more experiences in life. OK, well, I'll take one more and then we'll wrap, wrap it up. Um, so like you, like, <coughs> I do. Or still kind of keep that mentality, like at least kind of know the limits of those risks that you're taking. No, I do. I do. And they have really big, rich lives because of it. Um, but it, they scare me sometimes. My daughter um, is 22. Uh, she just moved to Washington, D.C. last week to start a job working um, for the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism. And her specialty is um, nuclear weapons used by rogue states. Um, and she, like, has moved with, like, no idea what she's doing, and it'll be fine, you know? Um, so I do encourage them to do that. I worry sometimes, when she was turning 21, she went bungee jumping, which I'm terrified of heights, so that really flipped me out. So I asked her, don't tell me about it till you're done, um, because I don't want to be worrying. And she goes, um, she goes skydiving. Um, my boys both ride motorcycles, and actually me and my two boys um, rock climb a lot together. 
so they all do this, but I think they, they are not, um, they're not 16 years old anymore, they're in their 20s. And the frontal cortex has developed enough that they have some limits on it. When they were younger, I had to be more careful about not encouraging too much of that. But I think, I hope, I pray that they are developed enough to be smart about the risks that they're taking. And you know, they've told me that watching my transition has been uh, transformative for them because they see that um, I have tattooed here, fail better. This is um, Samuel Beckett. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. That there isn't, you're gonna win or you're gonna lose, but you're gonna have an experience and that's gonna inform the next experience you choose. And as long as you're not choosing ones that are gonna end up with you getting hurt or dead or in jail, you know, we can, we can work with whatever we learn from that, you know, so. Thank you all for having me today. Thank you.